So thank you for coming this great long distance to talk yes. to us. Thank you, George, and also for asking me to do this. So when Sabina asked me this quite some time ago, I was really excited of actually doing this. So I said yes. And so then at some point, really, I was like, I started to think like, oh, how, how on earth am I going to do this? And so then I got a bit worried, but um, I started working on it, and I got more and more excited, and now I'm really coming home and giving this kind of presentation, which is actually a rather new experience for me. Uh, it's a different type of audience. So I, uh, I'll do my best and, and, and explain you what what all of this topological matter is. And uh, before I get started, I should mention Hans Hansen. We recently wrote a sort of more popular version of an article uh, about topological uh, matter. So that has been really helpful for me in guiding me uh, this story. So, so I, I'm a theorist, and, and, and the reason you can easily tell I'm a theorist. There's this thing, and I can't even put it in. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> oh, okay, there's another one down there. Okay, so. Oh, and it's full. It's full. <laughs> to be fair, a couple of experimentalists tried that too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now let's see. <laughs> so. Um, um, so wh why do we care? Maybe I'll just answer the question you I think these, these types of phases are better and hopefully we'll be able to these give you a hint of uh, really, really interesting, uh, really fascinating properties and I'll try to transfer some of my enthusiasm uh, on these things to you. And actually, uh, so this first part I will try to explain what they are and then in the second part uh, the last bit, I'll try to explain uh, how this actually might be used. Because at the moment, the realm of fantasy is still. Uh, so, um, I to say something. No worries. So, um, topology insulators have been around in the. Oh, now I remember. Uh, please interact and, and ask me questions. And for the physicists in the room, uh, if I think it's too technical, I'll just defer to afterwards. Uh, so, but please uh, give me feedback on uh, and, and ask questions if you think I'm not clear, because I might use terminology without actually knowing it. So, topological insulators have been around and have been uh, actually already appeared in the media. I'm not sure. I'm not sure uh, if you know who this is, <laughs> this is, I think this is Sheldon, is that correct? Yes. Yes. <laughs> He's Sheldon from Big Bang Theory, which is a sitcom. And, and uh, this structure will appear later on in my talk. If there's something here called block, I will talk about that as well. So uh, I'm not sure if anybody, uh, this particular piece is actually on YouTube, so I'm not sure if any of you have seen it, but. Who knows what a topological internet is? Okay, good. Well, where, can you can you try to explain in your own words? <laughs> I, think, I think that it's a substance that can conduct electricity in the book, but not in the edge or into the inverse. It's the inverse. I'll, I'll come to okay. that. Very good. But that is really the essence. Uh, so, but before I get there, I'm going to explain a little bit about uh, what uh, condensed metaphysicists actually do. I'm a little bit of the oddball in this conference, I think, <laughs> doing condensed matter. So I, I, I thought, as a good introduction, uh, uh, condensed matter physicists, what do they do? So, so what we want to know, for instance, is in what types of forms can uh, matter exist? And so, and, and if there's different forms, how do, they go, how do they go from one form to the other? And of course, the, the, the daily life example is, is Water which is falling from the sky, if it would have been a bit colder, it presumably would have been hail, especially in winter here, or snow. And so that would be a different form of, uh, of matter. Uh, and so there's this phase transition, we you know that stuff uh, freezes when you pull it down. And so this is the, the daily life example. And actually, water is a substance which is really hard. Water is not very well understood. But this is not my field at all. I don't know too much about that. 
So uh, the things I'm more talking and thinking about, for instance, is uh, magnets. Why do certain materials attract iron and things like that? But that's also not really my field. Another, uh, but perhaps a bit more exotic example is um, this one here, superconductor. I'm not going to explain how that works, but um, they're actually used in, in, in uh, like trains and things like that these days, I think. So, and these works uh, uh, discovered already uh, more than 100 years ago now, 1911. What they found is that when they cool down a piece of lead, which is a normal metal, uh, then all of a sudden when they got like four degrees above the absolute uh, lowest temperature that is possible, the resistance completely disappears. And so this uh, was their discovery of superconductivity. Of course, in the beginning, they thought they had some sort of shortcut somewhere. Uh, but uh, it, doesn't, it did, uh, turned out to be a real effect. And uh, it took up to the 50s to actually explain, uh, explain this phenomenon. So it took a long time for theorists to, to catch up and understand what was actually going on in, in these types of materials. So, um, so these phases of matter I'm actually not going to talk about. And so um, let's uh, start with some more familiar things, namely uh, metals. So copper. We have copper wires, like we use here. And so uh, some materials, they, uh, we call them metals, they conduct electricity very well. And uh, then there's other materials, like wood, or I'm not sure what this stuff is actually made of, but and there's also materials that do not conduct very well, what we call them insulators. And it's very good that we have them, because otherwise, if this plastic wasn't insulating, we would have a problem with <laughs> these currents in the first place. So, uh, so this is all very interesting, uh, having uh, these types of material. <coughs> but when it gets really interesting, it's sort of uh, when things are not really very well conducting, but they're not really poorly conducting either. And that's uh, semiconductors. So here's a bit of silicon. I've never actually knew how it looked like. I Googled, Wiki. I Googled a little bit to find a private picture. And so, um, so, so semiconductors are sort of a little bit in between. And so uh, that is very interesting uh, because uh, we can use them to do fantastic stuff. Um, then we, uh, we can use them to make devices which are called transistors. And uh, so this is how the first transistor looks like. This huge, dirty thing with all kinds of messy stuff floating around. And now uh, there's billions of them inside such a thing here. Uh, I'll uh, have PDF files of my talk. So you're very happy to take pictures, but uh, I think the slides will be put online. So you, so you, you don't have to take pictures, but uh, you're very welcome to, to, to do so. Um, so, uh, so there's been quite a bit of uh, um, uh, progress on this field. And the materials I'm going to talk about now, which are uh, these topological phases, which, which, are, which are being dealt with in the lab, they really look so <laughs> so there. Are, so, so, so this is where uh, where we should really think uh, our development is at the moment. Although uh, these developments would not have been possible without the semiconductor industry, uh, which had uh, given us these these simple chips. So I'll, I'll, I'll get there. And uh, well, uh, it's sort of a general remark. It's, it's hard to imagine. It's hard to quantify how much impact this discovery has actually made on society. So, um, so here we have uh, these semiconductors, and they are very interesting because they're not really conducting and they're not really insulating. And I'll actually, at some point during this first half of my talk, I'll actually explain why a metal conducts and why an insulator is insulating, because I will need that. Uh, and so, um, these topological insulators, as you already heard, they're also in between. And so, uh, they're actually uh, insulating inside. Yeah, but I, I have heard as well the expression topological superconductor or conductor is the same? 
Uh, there's also materials which are called topological superconductors. But I will mention them. In, I will mention. I will mention them in the end. Okay. Uh, if, I, if I get there at the end of the second piece. So they are different of that. So they are really superconductors, but they are special types of superconductors. So. Ah, okay. So, but I will not uh, have. Okay. It's a very interesting topic, but I will not have time to talk about. This. So uh, as I said, they are insulating in the bulk. And uh, they actually are conducting on the surface. They conduct very well. And it's, uh, so semiconductors are sort of, well, it's semiconductors, so they conduct semi, but uh, these uh, conducting uh, things on the edge, and I'll explain what this is, uh, they are very special in these topological insulators. And, and, and what is so special about them is that, say, if we have some, some topological insulator, and we throw in dirt, Try to disturb. It doesn't care. Still as in, as still as as conducting uh, as it was before. It changes shape. Properties don't care about this. It's, it's very robust. These, these, uh, the conductance is really insensitive to all kinds of uh, perturbations we try to put on, and that actually uh, uh, makes them uh, very interesting for potential applications. And so uh, the reason why they do this. Uh, is of topological order. This is why they're actually called topological in the first place. So, uh, so yeah. So we say that this conductance uh, of these, how, how these things conduct, is actually protected by topology. That's sort of the first word. Uh, and uh, so, during the next uh, part of my uh, of this uh, this first half of the talk, uh, I will try to explain. Uh, uh, yeah, how this comes about, um, and so, um, but this is actually maybe the, the essence. This is this is if you, could, if you wish you could see this as a take-home message, but yeah, at the moment you cannot understand it why this is, and I will try to. Uh, um, is it Dutch expression? I don't know the uh, sorry, uh, the Dutch one is is. Uh, uh, when you uh, with the bride, you lift a little bit of the, the gown, you just reveal it a tiny bit. So I'll try to okay. get you the first hint of it. And the yeah, precisely, yeah. So, um, uh, but before that, uh, so I'm going to talk about insulated metals later. But what I'll do is uh, I'll explain first a little bit about what is topology. And so. Um, so I, I, I actually I, I brought some things. These are these are data strings. <laughs> so so this is a uh, a normal string. It looks like this, and then uh, you, can, you can actually open them, but we're not going to be allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I have this other one. <laughs> so, yeah. It seems to be knotted. So is it possible without opening? Uh, the top, box, the, the top thing here. Is it possible to change, do something with this, like move it around or whatever, turn it inside out? I don't think anybody would think that you could make it into this form. But we can, we can, we can change its shape. We can do all kinds of stuff with it. Oops. It doesn't change its shape. It's very stable. This form will never change unless we take a scissor or we open it. And so the fact that this thing is knotted is actually a topological property. Without really taking a scissor, we cannot change it into this shape. <coughs> and so this is the essence about what topology is. We don't care about shapes. We really care about sort of the global property of how things are knotted around. <coughs> so here I did this with. Um, with ropes, basically. Uh, maybe people are more uh, used to do this in uh, with surfaces. This is how to point it. So they think surfaces. And so uh, the English word football has rather different meaning in Europe than in, in, in the United States. So a football <laughs> player would say that these things are not the same. Uh, on the other hand, if I uh, I would imagine I press this thing down a bit, or if I sit long enough on that one, uh, you can change the one shape into the other. 
And so by just without using scissors, uh, I can sort of deform this one into that one. And deformations uh, don't really mean anything topologically. So uh, the topologists would say, well, these things are perfectly equal to each other. And so what would be different is that if I would take scissors, cut things open, and then I glue them together in some sort of <coughs> essentially topologically different way, and uh, that would be something like this. So and so, so the difference here really is that this thing has a hole and this is not. So having a hole is really a, a, a topological property uh, which distinguishes a ball or a surface uh, from this uh, donut shaped thing. So um, this is actually topology is a really active field of research, and what I'll try to do is I'll try to connect this type of stuff with this metals and insulator things. So that, that will be sort of the goal. But before that, I actually want to uh, tell you a little bit about history of these knots. So any clue when do you think people might have started thinking about knots in a little bit more scientific way? So, yeah, so. 200 years ago? 200 years ago, yeah, something, something around that time. So um, it was uh, Scotsman Peter Tate uh, who had a machine for making smoke rings. And so uh, uh, he did, uh, and, and, and Sir William Thompson, who became Lord Kelvin, uh, but in that time, uh, this was like well, 150 years ago, uh, they didn't know what atoms were. They had no clue what matter was made of. And so there was this notion of, they thought that waves like light was moving through ether, and so this ether would be sort of maybe liquid, and then you would be vortices in the and then uh, Thompson developed the idea that, that uh, different atoms are really sort of different types of vortices in this ether. And so, uh, because they, they sort of already knew that, that atoms were sort of discrete things. You had different types of atoms, but you could not continuously change one atom into another. And so they had to, to create something which could explain this sort of discrete behavior. And then uh, they thought, oh, maybe different types of knots are this discrete behavior. And so, um, so what Tate started to do really started something we call now knot theory, and he started to start to, sort of to try to, to classify all types of knots in order to classify all types of atoms which are one. Now by now we know that uh, this was never gonna work because we know ether doesn't exist and we know actually what atoms are made of. Uh, so um, I think he actually got sort of what I'm impressed about this. And, at some point, Thompson took it up again. There's a whole kind of history that can be this um, So, uh, but the, um, this idea of, of trying to, to classify what knots are and, and how to tell them apart is a very interesting problem. And at the, uh, hopefully at the end of my second talk, I will actually come, in, I will come back to, uh, to these knots because if you try to use topological states of matter, basically what you're doing is you're making different types of knots. And so I'll, um, uh, I'll try to explain that. And so, uh, so one thing which is an open mathematical problem these days is that if you have a knot and you have another knot, uh, it's not always easy to tell them apart to see if the one knot is equal to the other knot. And so what you would like to have is sort of uh, we would have, have liked to have some, some abstract mathematical function which takes as an input, it takes a certain knot, and then it outputs some number or something. And then what you want this function to do is you want to, to say that if I put in uh, one knot and I put in a, uh, um, okay, now I have to tell it the right way around. So if you put in, in one knot and I put in another knot, and then if I get different numbers out, uh, then I would know for sure that these knots are different. And so there are some of these types of things around. The problem is, is that sometimes these functions, they give the same answer for different knots. So if, if the two knots, if the answers are different, then we know for sure that the knots are different, but there's no single such function which actually tells all knots apart from each other. And that's actually a, uh, some function like this, if we do that, it's called the topological invariant. And, uh, it's an active 
piece of research in mathematics to try to find such an invariant. So, um, uh, so this is some, some, some open problem. Uh, if you just look at knots, <coughs> so you think, oh, this is, should be rather simple, but it turns out to be really hard. So, uh, and then I will accept. So uh, just some examples, if not this is one I showed and I, I make this one and I make another one. So here there's lots of, uh, lots, of, uh, lots of knots here up to seven. <coughs> this is how they're characterized. You see these things going over and over each other. These are both crossings and then you can try to classify all knots with different numbers of crossings. And so uh, Tate already, I think he already went to, to all knots with ten crossings. Uh, and so here you can rather easily see which ones is different. But if you get more of them, uh, this actually becomes rather complicated. <laughs> are these two things, are they the same or not? Uh, and so it turns out that, uh, yes, they are the same. But in the literature up till the 70s, they were listed as different. So <laughs> at some point, somebody made a copying mistake somewhere, and then this got, got into the literature, and uh, uh, they were listed as, uh, as really different even though they are the same. So this was only rather recently, uh, recently corrected. So it's actually, uh, these <coughs> things can actually be diff difficult. And this might be one of these NP problems, I'm not sure. Uh, so, um, so, but, um, I don't get any questions. Is this? What is this? Uh, what is this notation? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, what does this notation mean? So, so here the notation, the, the three here is uh, how many crossings do I have, mm -hmm. and then the subscript is just they're just read they're, they're just you start with one, mm -hmm. and so with three crossings there's only one type of knot, with four crossings there's only one, but with five I have two types of knot, and they were just given one before it. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, this subscript doesn't mean so much. It just they were given some order. Meaning that there's two different ways to divide. Yeah, but not more. And I'm not even sure how to show that, actually. So. And at what yeah. point, if you get seven ways to do seven crossings? That's what this table says, yeah. I'm but not I sure if it was just cut off and there might be more. I, I don't know these numbers. Is there some sort of I think these numbers are known up to 14 or 16, and then people, uh, they don't know. No. It's the no, no, no formula which tells you uh, so many crossings and so many knots, and I don't even think that this number is known for more than 16. When you say that they are the same, you mean that you <coughs> change one to the other without the cutting? Yeah, precisely, exactly. So, so you, can, you can deform it, you can twist it around, but you're not allowed to cut. And so if you then can make one equal to the other. So somehow by, by moving these crossings around, uh, you can make this shape into that shape. Yeah. It's a good homework exercise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so... Um, Okay, good. So, um, so I, 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 I talked a little bit about something which is called the topological invariant, and that might have been a bit abstract. So I'm going to give an example, and then uh, I'm going to talk, talk later about physics, and then we'll, uh, I will tell you that uh, some of these physical properties are how related to these topological invariants. And so one um, topological invariant is uh, called the winding number. And so if I take a curve, something like this, I'm not sure how you see it, so this say, um, so let's say this is the starting point of my curve here, and I'm going to follow the curve along this line, and then I'm just coming back to myself here, and then I'm going to uh, count how many times do I actually go around the origin which is in the middle here. And so in this particular curve, I see that if I do that, I follow this curve, here I've gone around once, and now I've gone around twice. So, so this curve here has one number we call plus two. This direction counterclockwise we call plus two. That's just a choice. And so, as you see, I, my, my hand is not so steady. So if I if, if I'm sort of uh, uh, the fact that I'm uh, not moving straight on this line actually for this winding number doesn't make a difference. I'm still going around the origin. Uh, point here in the middle, I still go around it twice, even if I sort of do this very sloppily. And so if I change my curve a tiny bit, uh, this is not going to change the winding number, and so that's why uh, this thing is actually, uh, uh, why uh, small deformations uh, do not make a difference for this winding number. 
Yeah, sure, I'll answer this, but if you move the origin to 2, then the y number will only be 1. So, yeah, so, so I'm actually going to talk about that. Uh, it's very good. You're, if, I, if I would do something drastic to this curve, I can change the y number. And so uh, making small changes doesn't do anything, as I just said. But uh, I can actually make the winding number change by doing a, making a big change. And one of these big changes is just, if I would just take this whole curve and I shove it to the right, that I would actually make the winding number equal to zero. Uh, and so one way of doing that is uh, if I change my curve like this, so, so there's actually a continuous way to go from the curve I just had to this one. And I'm going to show this in a little movie. So, so here in this case, I'm going through the origin. And so then, it, then the, the concept of winding number around the origin is not even defined because I'm going to go straight, straight through it. So, so here, there is no winding number. And so uh, a point like this in these <laughs> topological phases actually corresponds to a phase transition from one phase to another. So, uh, so this is something uh, to keep in mind. Uh, if, if this winding number is not defined, uh, this actually is, is yeah, like I said, it's, can, it's a phase transition from one phase. And so if I uh, change my curve a little bit more, it might actually look like this. And so in this case, I'm going uh, in that direction. So I'm going around once, and I'm also going in the opposite direction. So in this case, uh, the winding number would be minus one, because I'm going clockwise around the other. So, um, can I ask a question? Sure. Because when you go to higher dimensions, then you can untie the knot. Can you? Very can good. you always go to a dimensionality so that you can untie every knot? So I gave this example uh, because uh, uh, it's easy to draw. And so uh, the system I'm going to talk about uh, is top is, is, has things which are topological invariant. And it's precisely one of these cases where everything is one dimension higher. So here, I'm, uh, what I'm effectively doing is I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping spheres on spheres, and I see how much uh, I go around. Uh, the, in higher dimensions, you can wrap, uh, sorry, here I'm wrapping circles on circles. Uh, in higher dimensions, you would be wrapping spheres on spheres, and how many times do you go around the sphere? So uh, <coughs> there are topological variants known in every dimension. So the answer to your question is yes. So uh, these types of things can be defined in any dimension, but in higher and higher dimensions, this becomes more and more complicated. And then they call it, say, churn numbers, and then there's all kinds of names. And I'm not going to talk about them. First of all, I don't really exactly know how they work. Uh, and uh, it would be impossible to draw this. Uh, and so this sort of gives the gist of, of what's going on. Can I ask one last thing? So is this then related to the problem of, for example, if I have a graph and I want to say it's a planet, or when you go to higher dimensions, <coughs> you know, like if you have a graph without crossings, if you go to higher dimensions, you can remove the crossings? So um, I'm not sure if you can always relate those types of questions to these topological invariants. Uh, so actually, I could imagine there is a certain connection, but I, get, I cannot definitely answer your question by yes or no. Uh, because I don't know, I basically don't know so much about graph theory and things like that. But, but the, 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 the topological properties appearing there are, are I think, similar to what's going on. Okay, so, uh, oh yeah, shall I show a movie how these curves can be curved? Yeah. I cannot embed that on this, on this thing. So, 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 this. so here uh, I have the curve I started with. And so now I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to, I have, have some curve which depends on, on some parameters, and now I'm just going to change these parameters around. So what you'll see is that. This curve will change, and if I change it a little bit, uh, you can follow it, and it winds still around twice. And now, here you see they get close to the origin, and now they cross. And now here, the winding number has changed. And so, changing these parameters, which uh, would be going from one type of system to another type of system, this this changing of parameters here would uh, 
uh, described uh, a phase transition between one phase and the other. And then I can change more, and then it starts to look like so, or then it sort of bends the other way around until it starts to disappear. So there I just took a simple example of the point. So here, uh, let's see, I have to actually check how it starts. So, it so here, what the winding number would be. So, 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 so here it starts uh, in this direction. And so uh, actually what it does here, it goes up first. But now actually it dips down and it goes up again and it dips down. So actually what I'm effectively doing is I'm going around once this way. Even though I'm going up first a little bit, I, I'm going to go under the origin of then, and then I'm going over it. So, so actually, two. effectively, I'm doing this. So it's one. Yeah, or minus one. Uh, and then to change that, uh, you would have to, uh, you would actually have to, uh, yeah, make it cross. And then you see that there's actually three lines crossing the origin, so that's why it goes from two to minus one. That's the difference mm -hmm. in three. Uh, which is uh, why uh, the two and the minus one are also. Yeah? How do you tell which way it's going? Isn't it symmetrical to... So actually, uh, uh, so, so, so I know what I, uh, there's a function I put in here, and that's why I have this little button here. And so here, uh, uh, I, I can just check which way it's going. Uh, and so, uh, so no, it, it's not precisely symmetrical. Uh, so when I just draw this full curve, you don't see in which way it's going. But the formula I put in is asymmetric between uh, uh, basically some sines and cosines of uh, things, and they have a direction. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. So, so if you just look at the curve, you cannot tell the difference because you could choose. Uh, but uh, because I know uh, what I put in, uh, I know it's one or the other. <laughs> But it doesn't really matter for the, the physics here. But it's a good question. So. Uh, unless there are more questions about this. So now I'm going to change gears a little bit. So so now until now I haven't really talked. I didn't really talk about physics. So so, so now I'm. going to talk about physics. So now because I did this, I actually lost my counter here. So I, know I had a little timer here which says how much time I had, but I lost it. So I'll show you the sign. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, so what I want to do now is I want to talk about really the physics of these topological phases, and I'll try to make this connection with these topological things. And so the first topological phase that uh, was certainly this is uh, identified to be topological, but it's something which we call the quantum Hall effect. And it was discovered in, in 1980. <coughs> and the device they had really looked like this transistor uh, thing. So, so that's what you should think, uh, laboratory. But that was very tiny, actually. Maybe a couple of millimeters uh, And so what, what they are doing is, is uh, the electrons, which uh, are the particles that carry the currents in these wires, they were sort of, they had a way of making them live in a two-dimensional plane. And they did this by having one semiconductor phased on another semiconductor or an insulator. And then they just applied some, some electric field to trap the electrons to the surface. And somehow they were able to, uh, to uh, really uh, confine these electrons to this, to this two-dimensional plane. And so then uh, what they had to do, uh, on top of that, go to very low temperatures like Kelvin or lower, so one degree above absolute zero, or maybe even less than that, and put on a very strong magnetic field. Uh, say 10 Tesla, something like that. So, what is that? That's maybe 10,000 times stronger than the magnetic field, maybe even more. Uh, don't quote me on the numbers. And so, let me first talk a little bit about what magnetic fields do. So, if you have charged particles that move in a magnetic field, they experience a force. Uh, just as part of the moving in the electric field. 
and this force is called the Lorentz force. And, and one of the properties is that if a particle moves in this direction and the field is in that direction, then the force will be perpendicular to both the field and the direction the particle moves in. And so if we now have uh, charged particles coming from the sun being shot at us, uh, and they get trapped in the, uh, in the magnetic field of the Earth, they start spiraling, spiraling around these magnetic field lines. And that's because of this, this perpendicular force acting on these particles. And then when they hit the, uh, the, oh, this is, uh, when they uh, hit the atoms in the upper atmosphere, uh, they give out light, and this is what is called the uh, aurora borealis, or uh, depending on which uh, side of the Earth this happens. And so, uh, one thing I wanted to remind, uh, to, to remember, is that, uh, yeah. Particles, charged particles in the magnetic field, they start to spiral or move in circles. And so then, uh, if we, uh, because electrons which are current carry the current, there because they're charged, something happens if we, uh, uh, if we take, uh, say, a little strip, say, of copper or some some ordinary device, ordinary material, and I'm pushing a current through. So I really should have drawn a battery here, which is, is driving this current through the sample. And so then this battery gives a voltage, uh, uh, so which is actually driving this current. And then uh, if I put on the magnetic field, what happens is that these, these electrons, uh, apart from feeling the, the force of this battery, just pushes them, uh, well, the electrons actually go that way, which pushes through, uh, because they're negative, uh, which pushes them through. They also experience a force. And so the electrons are pushed to one side uh, of this of this little strip here, and so what happens then is that uh, because of that uh, we have more electrons here than on the other side. They will build up a voltage which is precisely perpendicular to this current, and so this effect is called the Wall effect. And um, so what uh, what you can do is you can uh, if you have a sample like this, you push the current through your pi magnetic field, and then you can ask uh, what is this, this this voltage I get. And then, typically, what we do is uh, we, we, we try to measure something which is called resistance. Resistance is something how hard it is to, uh, for a material to conduct current. And that is basically the ratio of, of this voltage you put over with the battery to the current. And so if this ratio is very high, you need a lot of voltage to, to get some current. And so uh, something with high resistance doesn't conduct current very well. And in the same way, uh, we just defined that this something called hole resistance uh, as this ratio of this, this perpendicular voltage over the current. And that's just the definition. Uh, I think this is only one, the one thing I'm going to enforce on you because I'm going to use it. To use it. Uh, and so what you can def come wonder now is how does this whole resistance uh, change with magnetic field? And so the stronger the magnetic field, the more the electrons deflect the stronger this whole voltage or the bigger this whole voltage is and then uh, the bigger this resistance becomes. And so this is perfectly linear. So if you, if you plot this as a function of magnetic field here and I plot this whole resistance, if we would measure this, it would just be a straight line through the orbit. It's rather boring behavior. Although this, this type of experiment has been really uh, essential in, in determining properties of the material. So I'm not saying it's, it's not interesting, but uh, uh, the behavior we're going to see will be drastically different. Uh, okay. Questions? So now, uh, what we're going to do is, uh, uh, so this, this, this type of experiments were done in like 1890, I think, or something like that. And now we're going to do fast forward like 100 years. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make these electrons live on this two-dimensional surface, and we're going to make it extremely clean. We're going to make that the electrons really live on that surface. And then uh, we're going to lower the temperature to like a Kelvin or even lower. And then uh, we turn on the magnetic field. What do we get? So the king is a rather big. Yeah. Just a, a historical question. Why did they uh, study this system uh, lowering the temperature in the, in the plane? They was studying superconductivity or? So they were, this, they were, were trying to measure. Uh, properties of, of they were trying to understand these interfaces between semiconductors and insulators and, and things like that. Um, 
and, and to be honest, there have been some indications that some people thought something interesting could be happening doing this. Uh, so I'm not sure in this particular experiment what was the reason to do the experiment, actually, to be honest. So, uh, but they wanted to understand what happens if you make materials cleaner and cleaner and cleaner, and what are the conductance properties and <coughs> properties of those. So uh, what they found was the following. So first of all, uh, well, the, uh, they did this experiment and then they actually tried to measure one over. Uh, so they, they, thought that they found that the, uh, if we do this experiment at very low temperatures, this whole resistance became equal to uh, E squared over H, which are two fundamental constants of nature, times some integer. So we have this really dirty sample and the conductance becomes equal to an integer times fundamental constants of nature, which was known, which were known with high precision, also from experiments in accelerators and stuff. So, uh, so, so, yeah, the charge of the electron squared over Planck's constant, known constants of nature, we multiply that by an integer, and we find this conductance. Not just <coughs> approximately, but to one part in a billion. So you think about, even though they try to make it very clean, they're still dirty. And uh, you can see uh, this work pops which we're done a bit later, uh, and they, they change the magnetic field over some range, and this thing stays equal to this value times one for rather long range with the precision of one in a billion. Doesn't matter where I put my contacts, I can shift them around. I can change the oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, 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 uh, So, change the shape of the sample, change where I put my complex, it doesn't matter. Get the same answer, exactly the same, every time I do this. Uh, and so, at the same time, uh, when this whole conductance is quantized extremely well to this value, it also turns out that this long two mole voltage actually drops to zero. So, it's a little bit like a superconductor as well, but I'm not going to talk about it. But here we have a very dirty uh, semiconductor type physics thing. And uh, this ratio here is actually something which is which related by some factors of 4 pi, I think, to the fine structure constant, which is something which appears in quantum electrodynamics and they measure this thing in, in, in particle accelerators. Uh, these things completely agree with each other uh, up to like, uh, uh, mistakes in the measurement. And so now we can wonder why there's such a weird sort of things of semiconductors give this, uh, this very precise quantization of this physical conductance. Well, the reason is, and I'm going to try to explain that in a little bit, is that why this is so precise is that this, this conductance here is actually a topological invariant. So it, it turns out it doesn't have another choice than to, to, to have this one. And I won't be able to explain this in full detail, but uh, I'm going to try to give you the gist of it. So, uh, yeah, and so this is, became rather as a surprise, and now uh, these measurements are actually used as, uh, these types of experiments are actually used to define a standard for resistance. So if you want to go and calibrate a resistance, you actually, they, do, they calibrate it with this type of, uh, this type of setup. So uh, I'm going to um, try to explain this a little bit. And, um, so I'm going to try to explain what is actually going on here. And so, um, so, so what is going on here? Uh, so here we have the uh, we have a, we think we're now in this two-dimensional <coughs> plane where these electrons live. And sort of at some point, the sample just stops. So there's an edge. So outside there's vacuum, and then inside we get this weird topological liquid. And as I said earlier, what is happening is that these electrons, they, because of the magnetic field, they start to move in circles. And so really they are uh, doing their circling thingy uh, inside the bulk, and so they cannot move around. Uh, I'm simplifying the picture here a little bit. To just give uh, the, the gist of it. So in the bulk, these electrons are just uh, circling around a little bit, but at the edge, something different happens, because here, 
I cannot complete the circle. And so basically what is happening instead is that, uh, well, it cannot complete the circle because it cannot escape outside. So it just, it just hops around the, uh, the boundary. And so at the edge of the sample, I'm actually getting sort of a, uh, a way of conducting current along the edge. And it's this edge thingy here that actually uh, gives rise to this contact open. Uh, one thing you're also seeing is that because of the magnetic field, I forgot, uh, I think it's coming out of the screen here, this thing also just moves in one direction. And that's actually very important. The magnetic field is the cause of the fact that the, the electrons here, they can only move in this direction, they cannot move back. And so even if I were to put in some dirt here, uh, which in principle in normal materials, they could just send the electron back. And that would cause all kinds of changes in conductance and everything. In this system, that's not possible because, because of the magnetic field, the electrons can only go in one way. So if there was some dirt, it would just, it would just uh, yeah, do this type of motion around the dirt and, and it would think it's not that. So, uh, so just to summarize this, in the bulk, uh, these electrons move in their circle, so they don't conduct current in the bulk, but on the edge, uh, these things are called skipping orbits, and they just skip around the edge if there's dirt, so they just skip around the dirt, and, uh, uh, well, because of this property, the electrons cannot send, be sent back, and this is, in some sense, the origin of why this conductance is so extremely compact. There's actually other arguments for this, but then uh, I'll we'll get there a little bit. Uh, yeah. So how do you get the, the like there's steps, right? You, you go up, so, so, yeah, like, so, so what's, that, what's the next So you know, So the next thing is that, that actually, um, uh, <coughs> is it okay? I'm gonna talk a little bit about that theory. Is it okay if I defer this question and I'll come back to it sure. until after I've done that? Because then it actually will be easier for me to uh, to explain that. Um, so, um, okay, so I think, yeah, I will, I will think I will, that presumably will be this, the end point of my first uh, talk anyway, <laughs> or the first part of this. Uh, so, uh, so first of all, uh, uh, as I said earlier, actually, this is a, a resistance standard. And then, uh, one of these things is that now, in principle, you would like to use this, but it's not very practical because you need very high magnetic fields. Uh, uh, it's actually pretty expensive to create high magnetic fields, and there's low temperature. So, so these things are very interesting from a fundamental point of view, but uh, it's something which presumably will remain. In a, and so, people then thought maybe we can. Uh, get rid of this magnetic field, but it was very, uh, it was realized that, uh, uh, it, was, it was long thought that this magnetic field is really essential uh, uh, to do this, because if I don't have a magnetic field, I can have electrons move in this direction, I can have other electrons move, move in the other direction, they would scatter and they would change my conductance properties and all of that. So, for that reason, uh, it has way to it was long believed that this is not possible without the magnetic field. And then, 2005, uh, Charlie Kane and Eugene Mimi from uh, Penn, they actually realized that uh, uh, this magnetic field is actually not necessary. And so, uh, I'll try to explain that a little bit. Uh, but before that, uh, we, uh, we need to explain uh, the difference between matters and information. And so, uh, to do that, I actually have to take another step back. And that is just talk about energy levels. So, uh, I think by now you have seen this equation. This is the Schrodinger equation, which tells us how these wave functions, uh, uh, how they are related uh, to certain systems. This H is the Hamiltonian describing what system I have. And then, if you solve this equation, you know what energy levels what energy levels you have. And if you do this for a, certain, a single atom in a simple system you have, like the hydrogen atom, 
just a proton and an electron moving around, you can actually solve this equation and you define that as certain energy levels. And they're discrete. I'm not sure if this was discussed a little bit. That's uh, one of the conditions of quantum mechanics. And so now uh, to, um, uh, to actually describe th how things behave in, in, uh, in materials like uh, metals or insulators or materials we know of, not single atoms, uh, uh, we have to ask the question, what happens if I have a regular array of atoms and my electrons are moving in this, this regular uh, array? So, uh, when you say that they, they see a periodic potential, so, uh, these words are not so important, but we have a regular array of atoms, and then we ask what, uh, how do these energy levels look like? And so, this was, uh, I promised Bloch, this was in the, in the first slide. Uh, and so there's something called Bloch theorem, and it says that these wave functions, uh, they have something periodic, and there's something which is, looks like a wave. Uh, and the only reason I brought up this equation is that the, the, these things actually depend on something which is called momentum. Uh, and uh, the only thing you have to remember here is that uh, the energy here doesn't deform discrete levels, as in, in, in say, hydrogen atoms, but actually it, uh, it depends smoothly on this parameter k here. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the energy depends smoothly on, on, on momentum. And these, uh, that's why they actually do not form single isolated energy groups, they form bands of energies. Uh, so, uh, yeah. And we're going to use these bands to explain the difference between insulators and, uh, and metals. That might actually be a good place to take a break if you want to, or did you want to? Uh, how much? How many minutes will well, I zero, have? But zero. Zero. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but if, it's, if, you're, if you're at the climax, then you don't want to get away. It doesn't really matter for me uh, because if I want to go through this, I think it would take me a little bit over five minutes. So it's up, it's up to you. Uh, okay. Hey, but okay. Yeah, so <laughs> he continues. Five minutes or or roughly like that. Five minutes to finish the, this topic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so who wants him to continue for five minutes? Who would like him to break? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, she does get extra votes. Okay. Okay, so, okay. Uh, okay. so we... Uh, um, uh, so we have these, these bands, and then uh, uh, we actually... Uh, in quantum mechanics, what we then typically do is we fill these bands with the electrons. And so I actually realized that I forgot to, uh, to explain this, but electrons cannot take the same quantum state. Maybe somebody told you to this this Pauli principle. It's like the difference between this, that these things don't go through each other. And if I have two layers, I can just shine them through each other without a problem. Uh, so we have to fill these bands. And so then, if you, for a certain material, do a calculation, uh, you often find that there's a, a whole bunch of states here in a band, which is called the valence band, so you can put many electrons here. And then there might be sort of a, a region where there's no energy level. So here I put energy versus this, this parameter momentum. And then there's something called the conduction band. So there's also electrons here. So in a metal, what happens is that uh, I, I figure out how many atom, how many electrons I have in my system. So I fill up all these bands and I cannot fill it doubly, so I just try to fill the, the lowest lying bands uh, as first because that gives me the lowest energy. And then at some point, I, uh, uh, my electrons are, are gone, I don't have any more electrons to put in, and I might be in a situation like this. And to where I fill, uh, well, then I, one has to calculate, and it's called the Fermi number. So if I'm in a situation like here on the left hand side, um, the uh, uh, the conduction band is partially filled. And if I now uh, apply an electric field, uh, what will happen is that some electrons which are lying in these states here, close to this Fermi level, they will just move to a different state here. So applying a very small electric field, I can move these electrons up a little bit to say towards here, and once they're here, they can actually conduct. And so in this region here, I can just apply a tiny field and move my electrons around a little bit, and I will get a current. 
Now, if I happen to be in a situation like this, where this valence band is completely filled, and this conduction band is completely empty, so then if I try to give some of these electrons which are lying here, and I try to give them a tiny bit more energy, that doesn't work, because there's no states available. So the only way I can give a little bit more, or I can give more energy to the electrons is I actually have to move them over to this conduction band here. But that actually turns out that if this gap is big, it costs a very large uh, amount of energy. So if I just apply a very small field in a situation like this, well, the electrons have nowhere to go, so they just stay here. And so this uh, thing here, this, this band here will not be occupied then, and then there's no current. So in an insulator, or a band insulator, uh, the fact that uh, there's a valence band which is completely filled makes the thing insulated. And here in the metal, uh, I have in my electrons which I can just move around a little bit by tiny electric field. Now, of course, if I apply a huge field, I could do this, but then my insulator would just completely break down. Uh, so, um, so that's the difference. Uh, uh, okay, this works. Uh, and so this is really the difference between having a metal or insulator. And what material does what? You actually have to do a calculation to calculate how these pictures look like. So for a particular realization, this is not so easy. So... And when the, do the polar insulators uh, fit in this picture? They do, but that will be after the break. Oh, okay. But I do want to come back to, uh, uh, to the quantum hole insulator and explain what is going on there. Because that now very easily fits into this picture. And so what happens there is that uh, there is a situation here where I have a valence band which is completely filled and uh, uh, there's a conduction band which is completely empty but now there's one additional state and that additional state turns out to uh, connect uh, this valence band to this conduction band and so uh, however, so here to, to see this you have to do a calculation uh, that this actually happened but now if I uh, how many ever electrons are put in, there will always be one state available which can conduct. Namely, this one, which is at the edge. And so, uh, this is precisely this edge uh, mode I was uh, explaining pictorially uh, 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 earlier on this picture. And, and uh, it's, it's this thing here that conducts, connects the valence band to the conduction band. Which, uh, which causes this conduction. And wherever I put this, this Fermi level, it's not going to make a difference because I always will, will, uh, uh, will go through this, this red line here. So there will always be one edge mode. Only, only one state, or there could be a more. So, more so, so, so no, and this is coming back to, to the question which was asked namely, uh, what happens? Can I, can I get more states? And it turns out that in, in the real situation, this is a simplified picture. I can have a valence band here, a conduction band, and then there could be another band, and there could be one thing connecting two things there as well. And so, uh, actually, this picture is only uh, part of the whole spectrum, and uh, uh, I could have various of these modes connecting the different bands, which could then give rise to these different plateaus. So, so that is sort of, in short, the, uh, the answer to the question, can I also explain the other plateaus? And uh, there can be situations that uh, there will be more of these lines connecting the different bands, and they can then conduct at the uh, at the edge of the same. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a bit slow. It's been a long week. Yeah. What is that? Is it a tunnel? I mean, is it? No, no, no. So, so okay, good. Uh, uh, so uh, the picture will actually be a little bit clearer uh, when I talk about topological insulators. So, so what is this great block is actually? There's very many lines which are these energy levels. Because and then there's so many that I just drawn this degree. I didn't really do a calculation, I just drew a picture. In principle, I could have done a calculation. Uh, and so you would see very many of these levels here, which with, with continuous lines which, which go from this side to that side. Here, uh, there would also be such lines, but those would correspond to, uh, I wouldn't have electrons enough to put in there, so those would be empty. So here are the filled ones. And then, apart from these lines which are around here, there's just one single line which just connects these two, 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 uh, two blocks to each other. So these, this, this line here uh, is basically equivalent to all the lines which are in here, which are drawn, just drawn with the, drawn with the gray block. Uh, 
So this one is, 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 is not, di well, it's different from all the other ones in the sense that it lives on the edge. Well, well all these lines here correspond to these, to these circles which I was drawing. Uh, is there any meaning to the curvature? So, good, thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, so we can look at the slope. Uh, which direction this line is going, and that slope is actually it turns out to be uh, directly related to the direction in which the axes are going. So the fact that this slope always goes uh, goes up to the right mirror means that the electrons can only go in one direction. So uh, and then this curvature, well, this is that really then says how fast they really go. But, but the fact that they this 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 always points in points in that direction really means that the electrons can only go in that direction. Not in the other so one. You calculated the, the well, this, 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 this I just drew here, but you can do a real calculation, and I will show a real calculation in the topological case. So this, this curvature is different than the other curvature? Yeah, so, so different systems, system system. depending on how the system precisely look like, this, this, this thing will look, will look slightly different. But, uh, Meaning. Yeah, it has meaning, and here, but I just drew a room here. But there is really meaning to this. Uh, and and uh, after the break, I will, uh, 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 yeah, I will, I will show pictures of that. So will the shape change if I put the open circle? Oh yeah, definitely. But what it cannot change, it, it cannot remove this line. Yeah. So 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 the fact that this starts here and ends there is not affected by Dura. But if I put in dirt in the system, this will, will definitely change. It will shift this line around. It will change its curvature. Uh, but it will always connect the vein band, conduction band. Thank you. Yeah. So why are we uh, calling it topological state? Okay. So the um, very good question. I didn't actually put that on the slide. But so the. Um, uh, so this thing here, this line, uh, um, uh, I have to think a little bit how I say this. So <coughs> I'm trying to connect it. It's actually not connected to these winding numbers, but to one of these higher dimensional analogs. Uh, so uh, but what, one, what one could think of that is that this momentum here is actually something which is periodic. And that comes from the fact that we have a periodic lattice. And so this left-hand side here really is equal to this right-hand side. It's, these are the same points. So you should think of this picture as being on a, on, on a cylinder. I cannot draw it like that. So, so this, this side here is really equal to that side. And so then uh, this band, if I would draw it completely, it would start some, somewhere like here, and would go around, and then it, it ends up there somewhere. And so now what one can do is one can uh, actually ask the question, if I uh, would, uh, in some kind of space, which I'm not explaining here, but if I would draw what is going on from, if I start drawing a circle or, or a curve from this side to the other side, uh, and I, I draw it in a certain plane, it, it really would be something like, okay, uh, I start somewhere here, and then uh, how many times does it ride around? And so that connection, uh, if I want to explain that in full detail, so uh, that would require quite a bit of mathematics having to do with these periodic block functions are a show. But this uh, winding number, like this curve is, uh, this mode only, like the curve in... So, so this curve is in some space I didn't explain, and, yeah. and, and this point here, so, so we could typically call this k equals zero, and then um, we call this thing here, we could yes. call k equals two pi, which we got the same, the same thing. And then I can just ask, how many times does it run around something? Now really, what this thing is about is how a sphere wraps around a sphere, which is more complicated. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to explain that. But uh, what, what is really going on is that in, in, in this first plateau, I have something uh, which sort of winds around something else once. And if I would go to that next plateau, uh, well, it would, do, mm -hmm. it, it, would, it would do something like that. It would wind around <laughs> twice. And then for the next plateau again, it would wind around three times. Uh, but then, as I said, it's not really winding number in this case, but something. And so, uh, so here I have to be a bit hand with you, but uh, uh, I think there's more. But that's the 
that I hope this sort of gives a favor anyway. Yeah. yeah. That was when you were changing the plateaus, you were, you were changing the topological invariant? Yeah, and so there you actually have to go through a phase which is non topological. Okay. And so you actually see that, that uh, in this, uh, in this first picture, which yeah. we were, were, where the, uh, the experiment was. So here you see that that uh, so so this phase here there's zero uh, resistance along the current, and then when I go from one plateau to the other, uh, I I have sort of what is called the phase transition, and so then I'm really changing the topology from here to here, and so in between it's not in a topological phase, uh, and so uh, that's why I can change the topology in the first place, and and with these winding numbers that has to do with the fact that. Pushing some line through zero. So, so in non topological phase, what will it do? Like, um, how will you understand that it is a non topological phase physically? So, so uh, physically, you can then also, uh, in say a non topological phase, the winding would maybe something like this. Okay. Things would run, and it wouldn't run without the origin at all. And then the conductance zero. will drop, right? Sorry? The conductance will drop. Or, or so, so in this case, the uh, actually here, it's, this is a plot of resistance. Okay, so the resistance will drop. So if I go from mu equals one to mu equals two, the conductance increases and the resistance okay. drops. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, actually that's probably a good place to. Yeah, yeah, no, I was actually already doing the questions. And then we, um, <laughs> well, we take a five-minute break, and you can come up and ask questions or pursue your line of questioning if you like. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the first talk. I mean, I understand what you meant about bands, but what is it? Is it acting as a kind of tunnel between those two, or does something happen? No, so, 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 the, um, um, okay, maybe I should draw a picture which is a bit more accurate than that. Okay. Than that one, because there I sort of drew these blocks. And so, really, what, what the picture sort of looks like is that. We have a system like this. So then we uh, we do this calculation and we, we, we solve this Schrodinger equation for this particular system. And then what you see is that that uh, for a normal type of insulator, you get like bands like, like this. And then here there's also bands. So these are the uh, functions of momentum. Or? Yeah, so this is this is this momentum here. And here I'm plotting the energy. So just as in, in these hydrogen atoms and all kinds of atoms you have energy levels, here these atoms, because we're in this periodic potential, uh, the spectrum would look like this. Now if you solve uh, the same problem in, in the case where there is a magnetic field, then you find that depending on your parameters a little bit that there might be some other band which just looks like that. And this just comes out of the calculation. For this to happen, here I can do so, so, so this band here is just like all the others, in some sense, in the sense that it's an energy band. And so it, it just acts in the same way uh, as, as all the other bands. And so we just fill them all up, and then uh, once we run out of electrons, then we might be here somewhere. And then if we're in this region, uh, we're on one of these quantum hole plateaus, and it's, it's this state here which is different in the sense that if you look where this state is actually living in the, in the sample, you can just look at this wave function and see where is this wave function non-zero and where is it zero, then you see that it's only non-zero on the edge of this sample. This thing here, if I draw a sample like this, uh, and these types of states, they, they live here and they correspond to these circles. And if I draw a similar thing for this state here, you see that actually it is here on the edge. And so in that sense, so, so this picture in that sense is a bit misleading because I sort of singled out this one thing. And it is very special because it lives here on the edge. 
but on the other hand, it's just like a band, uh, uh, an energy band, like all the others. And so it's not really a tunnel, it's not like a black hole and then you <laughs> can do something like that. It's just a normal energy state, uh, but uh, it has peculiar properties, and that is, it's really given here and it can cause this conductance. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, and so if I uh, if I would change the, the chemical potential, then uh, I would just move this line upwards, and I see that I always have some 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 states here which are close to this level here, and so that's why when, when I move around on these plateaus with my magnetic the field, basically what I'm doing is I'm uh, changing to where I have to fill up this 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 band, but I always have some electrons which are. Uh, because of this band, I always have some states that no energy available, which is quite interesting. These are actually rather complicated things uh, to understand. Actually, uh, so so it's it's uh, very good that you ask questions about this. So we have to try to figure out what's going on. Okay, thanks so much for the comments. Are there more questions about this? Uh, actually, the momentum is two-dimensional. Yeah, uh, normally actually in, in, in so, that. So it should be a, a three-dimensional picture, and uh, yeah. this line is helical. So, so the um, uh, it depends a little bit on how you do the calculation. But typically, you have two two No, this edge mode this, uh, this is chiral. This this is the topological effect. Yeah. So, so, so the fact that it's it's. Um, um, it corresponds to state which go along the whole thing assembly. And it's chiral because of the magnetic field. That's why uh, this band will look like that. And so what I'm going to explain now is what goes on uh, in these topological insulators where there's been which, which appeared in Big Bang. And, uh, I'm gonna with the picture will look very similar, but actually there's a big insight. So, so this, this actually, uh, this, this happens when you push your current and you, you actually populate these things and the world will stop moving. So, so that one was a little bit of a simplified picture there. Uh, of course, you cannot really bunch, you cannot really bunch them up some. Mm -hmm. It's actually a rather intriguing thing that I always try to explain when I teach a electromagnetic. You, know, you turn on a switch to, to, to light a uh, Turn on a light bulb, all the electrons start to move simultaneously. And how, how do they arrange that? <laughs> That's actually not such a huge problem. But let's not <coughs> start <coughs> talking about different things. So, so uh, now I want to talk about these uh, um, uh, topological insulators. So, and the big breakthrough here was. Uh, was due to Kane and Lee, and uh, what they realized is that uh, so far this magnetic field has been crucial in, in getting these electrons to move in one direction, and so that there's really no way for them to turn back, and so that was one of the reasons why this conducting was complex. And so, uh, so what will happen in this type of a model here, uh, in this type of a system, is that you actually have two edges which move in different directions. And somehow, there is a way of, of uh, this to happen without these electrons uh, scattering back, uh, without changing the conductance. And so to understand this, uh, uh, why this is possible, uh, I have to introduce one property, uh, which is spin. So I assume that you've heard about this uh, in the talk, I think you we also got this concept. So, so so electrons, they not only have charge, but they also have spin. And uh, you can think about it as a little spinning thing, but with a very special property that it can spin in one direction, it can spin in the other direction, but also simultaneously as a linear superposition of both things. So there's no classical analog of this. And so an electron can be in sort of a superposition of a little bit of up and a little bit of down. 
And so now uh, there is a, uh, a theorem, which is called Kramer's theorem, uh, which I'm not going to prove to you, uh, but so I hope you just, uh, physicists sometimes don't talk, so just trust me if you don't believe me. <laughs> so um, there's something called Kramer's theorem. Kramer's theorem, it says that in, a, in the absence of magnetic fields, all the energy levels you get are sort of degenerate. There will be one for spin up and one for spin down. And so uh, the energy levels we have as a human pairs uh, if we not have these magnetic fields or similar types of effects. And so what type of magnetic fields can we have in general? So first of all, we can just put a magnetic field ourselves. Just have a big coil and we send on the other hand, uh, the electrons themselves, they move in orbitals, uh, which, I, which I had earlier. And so the electrons themselves, because they're charged, uh, they will also produce their own magnetic fields. And if that happens, this is something called spin orbit uh, Name is not so important, but there are different sources of magnetic fields, maybe the external ones, which we decide, and then there's the one, the internal ones, which we don't really have control of. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah. And so the one thing we need to remember is that uh, if there is no magnetic fields, the, the energy bands can be And so now I'm actually sort of already ready to draw the picture uh, which I had earlier, um, which, uh, which takes into account uh, this, this realization of kingdom. So, and so this is, uh, so here this is not so visible, but here I did the same thing as uh, in the previous case, but now uh, I, I, I draw several lines here, uh, namely there's a, a, a blue line and a red line, which corresponds to say spin up and spin down state. And so, um, and so for certain values of this momentum, so for certain of these vertical lines here, uh, it turns out that these spin orbit effects are completely absent. I'm just telling you this. Uh, I'm not going to try to explain that. But for certain of these, these values of momentum, uh, we have that uh, all the states have to come in pairs. And I, I, I've labeled these things here uh, in A in these two pictures. And so now what can happen is that if I, uh, uh, one possibility is that if I have these, these sort of certain states here, they can say start in the valence band and move back to the valence band. So in some sense here, they're part of the but at this point, uh, they have to cross. And there's no way of, of them doing that because of Kramer's speed. And so then, uh, there's actually two things, two ways I can, can draw this picture with having two states going through uh, this point A. So in one case, uh, the states go back to the valence band. They start, start in the valence band and go back there. And the other possibility is that uh, they start in the valence band and they go up to the conduction. So uh, there's two ways of, if I have such a point here, and I have some state here, which is not in the large gap, and there's two ways of, 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 two distinct ways of drawing this picture, namely, in one case, uh, it starts in the band and it ends there, and here it starts in the band and it goes up to the convection See, you, you, uh, you mentioned that there are no magnetic fields. It means there is no spin orbit coupling or no external magnetic field. So here there's no external magnetic Okay, so it should be, okay, even in the absence of external magnetic field, there will be only few fixed points where the en energies are degenerate. Yeah, and this is, in this case, this is only this one. Okay. So, <coughs> and so, so uh, if, you, if you do these types of calculations for these models, Kane and Marie wrote down, which I actually not going to explain. But they wrote down some models, uh, and so then uh, you see that if you, if you solve for these bands, there are these special points, and the moment is zero in this case, uh, where, where these bands have to cross. And there's no, there's no other way, and it's, it's, it's due to a theorem in quantum mechanics. And so, uh, but now we see that in this case, uh, 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 there's still a large gap here, and you can sort of slightly deform these levels, but uh, we can never, uh, by just slightly deforming them, we cannot make them go from here all the way up. So there's two ways of, of drawing this, namely the left, right, the left picture and the right picture. 
So this is a normal insulator. Uh, maybe there's a large gap. And I can just move these things down. It doesn't have to be this point here. It could also be in here, or maybe a little bit higher. So I can, where these, 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 these bulbs are, I can move around. As long as I have this, this, this vertical line here, <coughs> there's the cross. And in this case here, uh, I cannot change the fact that this part, uh, you know, in the end of, but I can move these lines around. But however I push them around a little bit, uh, there will always be a uh, tool going from the bottom. And so here you also see that uh, because the, the slope here uh, is in one direction for the red line and it's in the other direction for the other line. So I really see that I now have two edge modes, one going in one direction and the other going in the other direction. But uh, because of the fact that this three room says they, uh, they have to cross here, they, they turn out to be uh, uh, <coughs> kind of remove these things. As long, of course, if I put on a magnetic field, uh, then this whole picture goes out. So I can destroy this by, by putting on a magnetic field. But as long as I don't do that, I will have these crossings and then I have these two possibilities. So now, of course, um, well, of course, it, it is not given that, that either one will, will happen in a certain case. We actually have to do a calculation of uh, when this happens and when that happens. And so Kane and Melinda were talking about a model for graphene. And so there, it turns out that it's actually always on this side. <coughs> they realized that there was this possibility. So, uh, um, so, uh, so, yeah, so, so Kane and Mali, uh, they had a model for graphene, where actually it turns out to be always trivial. But uh, they really, the big insight was that there are these two possibilities, which are probably the same. But are there models where you can actually calculate the uh, right hand side? Yeah. This is the next picture. So, uh, so what uh, following King and Mali, Zang and co workers, uh, they actually came up with a system where you can, can see this. So, I will go through, uh, through the experiments which, uh, which show this. And so, uh, it turns out that if you do a calculation, there's some, some semiconductor type material which is called cadmium tellurium. Uh, that turns out to be trivial. So, here you see these. Here. And a little bit more clear uh, than I there. And so then there's another type of material which is called mercury tellurite. And that turns out to have the right properties which um, uh, make that you have these, 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 these edge modes here which are protected by having this, this, this uh, spin up and down in the absence of any mercury. And so this is, not, this is a real calculation in some, in some model for these materials. And so not only did they realize that, they also came up with an experiment of how you can actually distinguish these two ways. And so this is where uh, this picture of Big Bang Theory comes back. Where I mean, we do a sandwich of cadmium tellurite, mercury tellurite, and cadmium tellurite. And so then uh, what happens is the following. Uh, so what, uh, what the proposed experiment was is you can sandwich is this, this topological stuff in between the, uh, the, the cadmium tellurite. And if this layer is very thin, then the whole material will be sort of dominated by the, uh, by the trivial type of behavior. You have to do a calculation to show this. So if you take a very thin layer of, of mercury tellurite, then you will see a trivial type of insulator. Now if you make this thing thicker, then here in this region, uh, it will turn out that the, uh, the behavior of the material is such that you see this topological and so one of the nice things about this experiment is that we can actually tune the thickness and see uh, that at a certain thickness, uh, well, for a very low layer, you see the normal behavior of the insulator. And then all of a sudden, when the thickness is, is big enough, you see the other behavior. And so this, this way of using this thickness as sort of a control parameter was, was a really interesting you know, way of seeing doing things. Why do you need the cadmium? I mean, it's... Okay, so this is actually... Uh, so, so why they use these materials? Well, these people know their, their semiconductor physics very well. And so, uh, so first of all, to, to make these interfaces, uh, these materials, you have to be able to stack them on top of each other in a very low, in a, in a very good way. 
And so it turns out that the distances between the atoms in cadmium telluride and mercury telluride is, uh, it matches very well. So you can make clean interfaces. And then the reason why they put mercury telluride is that because that has the right properties to be able to be used for colloidal effects. And in the end of the day, that has to do with properties having to do with spin orbit coupling and all that. So the mercury telluride is has vacuum on both sides? Of then in principle you would see, but, but then it would be much harder to be the experiment. Really but, and, and here, the nice thing is that you can also use this thing as this tuning parameter, that you can see, uh, if you make it thin enough, the effect will disappear. So that's what uh, uh, these experiments will be really convincing. And so, uh, you know, I'm going to show you what they found out. So if they did these measurements, they measured some, uh, some, uh, uh, some resistance. And so in this case, where this layer is very thin, I'm not going to explain the details of the setup. But so, to, so this is the region of gate voltage you have to focus on where they're really probing these interfaces. And so there you see that the resistance gets really high. It just shoots up to, to some value and then uh, they can, cannot really measure it. And you know, it even higher. They are limited in, in their measurements. And so this is for these small cases, the, these thin layers. And then they, they, they increase the thickness of their, of their, of their uh, of their uh, cadmium telluride, of their uh, mercury telluride region. And there you see that, so this is a function of, of uh, so this curve is for a small uh, thin layer, and here you do thicker layers, various thicker, thicker layers. And there you see that uh, the, the conductance uh, uh, is, is well, not really quantized, it's in this integer point of all effect, but you see that it takes this uh, sort of uh, quantized value. And the, the conductance becomes very close to this. Uh, uh, h over 2 d squared. And here they plot resistance. So it would be uh, 1 half d squared over into the conductance units. So this experiment uh, was really, uh, so this is not the only thing they did, but, but the fact that uh, these things would be followed the prediction being insulating in this regime and then topological or quantized conductance in the other regime really uh, is good evidence that this system really is popular. And apart from that, they actually did more. Uh, uh, so they also did some other experiments <coughs> which show that uh, these things really are corresponding to, to etching points that actually do some designs and clever experiments to see how these, 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 these uh, <coughs> currents behave and things like that. I don't have time uh, to, to, to discuss that in detail. But they verified that these things really are these chiral edge modes, and that also that this, this, this spin is blocked through the direction in which these edges are moving. So they're really going from the picture. This was done in a, in a group in Germany. So uh, I think we can really conclude that this system here really is a topological insulator, the ones without the magnetic field. And uh, by now, uh, this type of behavior has been observed in very many types of systems, uh, not only in these uh, two-dimensional systems, but also in more three-dimensional systems. Uh, there's now a big industry of uh, uh, coming up with uh, different types of uh, materials and then people are uh, doing all kinds of experiments on this to, to, to show uh, these uh, steps between the surfaces. So this was the, 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 the paper that we experimentally opened up. Show this behavior. Yeah. What is the difference between the three colors? So, so here I think, uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I think these were different thicknesses, all bigger than this critical value. I'm not sure, maybe they also vary the temperature. And so maybe I should also tell what the, here this, this in, your, in, the, in the quantum hall case, this was really quantized to one part in the building to this line here. And here it still looks a little bit murky. And one of the reasons is that. Uh, in the quantum Hall effect, there was really only one edge channel. But here, if I would have some impurities which are magnetic, uh, that would actually influence these things a little bit. So if I have impurities which are non-magnetic, this would be, uh, this wouldn't have an effect. But if I have some magnetic impurities, then that actually does pull up the conductance uh, a little bit. So, so one doesn't expect this to be as precise as in the So, uh, I 
think a bit over time, I guess. <laughs> These were conclusions of part one. So, uh, make sure how much time I have left. Mm -hmm. I do have some time left, uh, I guess. Just about half an hour. Half an hour, okay. Then I will, uh, actually, the second part was going to be a bit shorter anyway. So, we'll see. Uh, I will uh, uh, talk a little bit about different types of properties there. So, uh, so one thing uh, which I didn't really say, but uh, as we saw with superconductivity, the explanation came like 50 years after its discovery. The quantum Hall effect, uh, the explanation came maybe a few years after its discovery. But each time the experiments came first. Topological insulators, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, predictions were first and then the, the experiments came. And one of the reasons is, is that um, topology is actually what was playing a very uh, Push your wall. So I guess in principle you could have done the same thing with your wall effect. Uh, but uh, if you have typically calculated conductances and coming up with predictions, uh, well, first of all, the experiments are hard and, and the, the conductances themselves. Uh, the predictions are not as precise, theoretically. And so here, uh, with topology in the problem, you can do very precise predictions and then uh, these can be tested. And so, uh, in my point of view, uh, the, uh, these topological insulators, because they have these very special properties, which stays on the, living on the edge, which, which are conducting, uh, that's very interesting from a fundamental point of view that you have something like that. But, uh, well, maybe you can actually use them for something like this as well. That's, uh, well, I'm not sure if I would be able to, to, uh, uh, to get there. Uh, where this might be, be actually used, these types of things, but I will tell about some of the peculiar properties which can happen in some of these different things. Yeah? Just a couple of questions. First of all, um, if you need to skip some of the intermediate material to get to the I was actually, I already, in the break, I already thought about okay. what part I can skip. Yeah, it's, but it would be good for us at least some point to hear about some of these practical devices. Yeah. Because I think that's important. Yeah. And so uh, that will come right at the end. And so I will, uh, first I have to convince you that uh, some of the, the, the particles which can occur uh, in these types of states, uh, well, that special things can happen. So that I will explain, and then I will just hop over and stuff, and then it all together. Then I will have to, of course, well, I'll try to summarize very quickly, uh, and then I have to sort of, I will say a few things, and you just have to take them through. Of course, <laughs> don't, skip, don't skip the applications. No, no, no. I will. I will. At the end of the talk, I will actually uh, uh, go to to, uh, to those things. Okay. I just had a quick science question. Um, in the magnetic field case, you had that kind of stair step pattern mm -hmm. by just dialing up the magnetic yeah. field. Do you have anything equivalent here? Um, so you wouldn't be able to do that just with the uh, or something similar. So, so there are people um, um, uh, there are systems where you can uh, get bands, which, which where these, these these states connecting one band to the other, where they have different topological properties, which would then give twice the quantum that, like that. So, so. Uh, but this is all in theory. So in theory, you can do this, no problem. But uh, in uh, in experiments, as far as I know, this is not going to. Uh. Um, two quick questions. Um, with graphene, was it surprising that the case was only trivial? Because we're only talking about the special edge states in graphene. So you think that? I mean, I don't know. Maybe because. So no, no, it was actually expected that. It would be oh, it was expected, yeah, yeah, yeah. was it? Okay. And that, that has to do okay. with these, uh, the, the, these capillary telluride, mercury telluride. They're really heavy atoms, okay. and they give rise to very strong kinetic of coupling, which okay. is actually necessary here. And so carbon has very weak coupling. So that, that's this is a uh, uh, that, that's the answer. Okay. And. Um, if I'm wrong, there was some research recently about um, people building in analog photophological um, photophological um, insulators using photons instead of electrons. What what was the reason for doing that? Why did they want to do that? Because I think there was a proposal to do it, and then they did it using light. Okay. 
Okay, I am actually not aware of those experiments. So uh, one of the reasons why you could try to do this is that uh, with light, with laser light and things, it might, you might get much better control than in these dirty semiconductor systems. So, so, so one of the reasons, is, oh, first of all, it's very interesting to do with light up bosons, or to do this with bosons instead of fermions is really interesting on its own right. And it might give you better control. Uh, like also, people who use cold atom systems a lot for simulating condensed better systems, for example, they're trying to do that. And so, that you could, so, so sometimes with these systems you could set up a sort of remote system. So. Okay, so, uh, second part of my talk. Uh, so now what I'm going to tell you first is that uh, these applications for these devices, uh, we need special types of particles to, to, to be able to do that. And, and so what I'm going to, so my first part now will be to, to sort of try to convince you that in some of these phases, uh, uh, well, I'm going to, first part I'm going to explain this for you. So Question for you? Yeah. No. Are there other uh, opinions? I hear a no. We're not going to do this democratically. What do you mean by explaining the non election? Just talking about it. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Maybe have the other way around. Not as far as we know. <laughs> No, an electron is, so far we know, an elementary particle. So as far as we know, uh, we cannot split an electron. But we can do something else. Now, if we have very, very, very many electrons, can we do something? We go split into different groups of, of electrons. So uh, what I'm hinting is, is, is the following. Anderson, there's actually a very nice connection between condensed matter and, and, and high energy. So in both fields have benefited a lot from each other. Uh, he, he came up with a quote which says, more is different. So if I have very many electrons, they can actually behave like, uh, they can create which we, what we call an excitation, which behaves like something uh, which is smaller than the universe. But they can only do this by, <laughs> by working together as a bunch of them not just a bunch, like extremely many of them. So uh, with very many electrons, we can actually create something which looks like something which is sort of half of the And this I'm going to explain. So I'm not talking about here how we chop up an electron into bits. But what I'm going to explain to you is, is uh, um, uh, how very many electrons can actually behave as if there are particles that... Uh, what do you mean to combine electrons in pairs? I'll, I'll, you will see what I mean. Uh, so, um, so, yeah, this is basically said. Collectively, if you have very many of them, uh, they can sort of create an excitation of particles that are smaller than the electrons. And what I mean by that will, will be and so uh, there's a very uh, um, a famous example uh, which dates back to a little bit before quantum effects, uh, namely polyacetic. This was done by Shu Shu and Actually, this also this actually followed from work by uh, high energy physics a couple of years earlier. So they actually uh, they used some high energy insects. And so polyacetylene is basically it's a long molecule consisting of carbon atoms with uh, single and double bonds. So, uh, so here is my picture of carbon atom. We space them equally, so these are part of the molecule. And so what actually happens is that it's a chain of carbons, and as I said, there's uh, single and double bonds holding these, 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 uh, these atoms together. And so it turns out that uh, uh, 
the, the system does not want to have increased space captains, but they want to create bonds which are slightly longer and slightly shorter uh, behind each other, after each other. So basically, uh, the distance between these atoms is roughly one angstrom, but these atoms are displaced by something which is even much smaller, a uh, smaller distance. So here, this picture here is very much exaggerated. So what happens is that these two atoms are a bit closer to each other, these two are a bit further away, these two are a bit closer again, a little bit, bit further, a little bit closer, etc. Actually, draw these lines so that you can actually see this without these lines that you have to see in this picture, you know exactly what this is about. So, um, uh, so now what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to forget about drawing these dots and I'm just going to uh, uh, write a single line uh, if the bond is short, uh, a double line if the bond is short, maybe because the, the closer ones are actually tighter bonds, there's a double bond there and there's a single bond between these two bonds. So, uh, so now my polyacetylene looks like this, so I have alternating uh, single bond, double bond, single bond. And this corresponds to having uh, yeah, these different power atoms with these different distances. And so here I, I've done this in one way, and then I start single, double, single, double. And I can do it like that, but I can also do it the other way around. I can start with a, uh, a double bond and then with a single bond, double, single. And so these are two actually distinct ways of uh, doing this diagram. And so, uh, basically, this, this polyacetylene, what we say is that uh, there's two, two states, lower states of this polyacetylene. You can choose either this or that one. And in nature, it just spontaneously chooses one of the So now, we can think of what if we, uh, 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 so yeah, so these two things are, are sort of the lowest states of this polyacetylene. But now we can ask the question, what if we just, by some reason, force there to be two double bonds next to each other. This will cost energy, but and it will be charged, but we can do this. So, uh, so and this is called a kink. And so we can have a one place where we say have, instead of uh, all doing this alternating thing, I have a single bond, double bond. I do actually double bond, double bond in one place. Then like this. So then I actually I start with this pattern A, but now I create double bonds so I actually hop over to this pattern B. <coughs> so this is this is we call this thing a kink. Yeah. Sorry, does it always have to be two double bonds? No, you can also do single single. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I'm not gonna uh, draw this here. But that's <laughs> and so now uh, what we can do if we have such a single, single one of these kinks is that well, these things were actually bonds and they correspond to electrons and so an electron could hop from here to here. So these kinks, they can actually move around on these, on, these, on these chains. So if I move this bond here, I can actually just move it there. And then I have a, a double bond, single bond here, but then I have double bond, double bond here. So I actually I move the electron one step and I move the kink two steps. So then if I do that, the picture will look like this. And so then I can do this again, and so I can pop this thing here, and so I can really move this, this kink around, and it just happens because the electrons are around. So, so these kinks are sort of mobile places. Once I have one, it, it can move around with the chip. So, so so this is the message of these, these pictures here that the kinks can move around. So now uh, the interesting <coughs> thing comes when we actually put two kinks uh, on this chain. So now, uh, so first I have, uh, we, uh, I guess we go back. Uh, so here uh, I forgot to say is that because everywhere here I have three lines, so, so uh, this corresponds, and these, these lines correspond to electrons, so this is charged. And so here, Locally, I have four lines, so this means I have some extra charge here. So there's some charge sitting on this kink here. Now what I want to do is I want to figure out how much charge is actually sitting on one of these kinks. And so, uh, we do this. And so here we have a situation, we start with the A pattern, and we end with the A pattern, and there's no kink. 
And now what we do is uh, we create two of these kinks. So we start with A, we create a kink. Uh, we have two, uh, we have some charge here. Now we're in the B pattern, which really looks uh, like, I know, it looks like the B pattern I had earlier, so nothing special going on there. Then I create another kink, and then I'm back in the A pattern. And so now what we see is that we have some charge here, uh, which is localized here, and we have some charge localized here. Now I'm going to try to figure out how much charge do I actually have. And so for this, I'm going to put some stuff in the rock. So I'm going to look at a simplified model of polycycling, which is not really describing polycycling, but just for the sake of the argument. And so what I'm going to think of now is that all these lines, they just represent an electron. These are bonds, and this is just one electron. Real bonds are actually two electrons. But then, I'm, I'm just going to give an electron. And so now, uh, so each bond now is, is just an electron, which represents a charge. And if you count, uh, you can count how much charge is in here. Maybe I get 16 lines here. Uh, and here there's 17 lines. So in this case, I have, let's say, 16 charges, and here I have 17 charges. <laughs> Maybe I kind of wrong, but I, I know for sure that the difference is one. And so now, uh, uh, I see that in the second picture here, uh, there's uh, uh, one charge more than in the first picture. So there's one electron more in this picture than in the first picture. But now I also see that there's some localized charge here, and I've localized some charge here. And these charges can move around freely by, by just hopping on the electrons. And, well, this kink clearly looks exactly the same as that one. <coughs> so the only conclusion can be, if I count the charge, is that this thing has a charge in the half. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I think this is great. <laughs> So, but, so, so, so we, we, we created these kings. They have, and these kings can just move around freely. So they, they're charged, they really like charged particles which can move around. Uh, like normal particles can. They just hold it. And so uh, we, we created two kings here. So there's some charge here and there's some charge here. It can move around freely. And if I do the counting, I see that in total here in this system, I have one charge more than in this system. So the charge, the total charge of this system is, is uh, if, if I call this the, the normal charge or no charge at all, then I know that I've put in one more electron here, so the total charge of this system is one. And now what I've done is I've uh, created two kinks and I've distributed the charge, the charge I've added equally over these two systems. And so because I only added one charge and I've distributed it equally, it must mean that the charge here is a half and the charge there is a half. And I can only do this, of course, if I have many electrons. If I just have one electron, I can do this. So, uh, now this is a little bit of a simplified argument for polyacetylene, but uh, this is really at the heart of what we call uh, things, uh, uh, electrons falling apart from, electrons falling apart, twice not the right word, but creating excitations. We have a system of electrons, which are all charged one. But what I'm doing is I'm creating an excitation in the system of that, which has a small charge. That, that, that's what we're going on. Now I see very many fingers at the same time. I think you in the back were first. Um, do these excitations interact with something else? I mean, just to say, this is half because so and so, but it does it physically mean something also? So, so you can actually, uh, uh, you can physically observe these things. Now, in polyacetylene, the story is a bit more complicated, but uh, I will try to show some experiments where they actually can measure the charge as well. So yeah, so, so, so this charge here is, is really some physical thing which you can measure. Maybe not precisely in this type of system because it's a bit more complicated. But there are other systems where this happens where you can measure these types of charges. And you can do experiments which are sensitive to the charge and you see that it's yeah. Maybe this is naive or I'm thinking about this the wrong way, but what about all the hydrogens? Because you've got in the top, oh. you've got three bonds on each carbon, so you must have hydrogens going on. Yeah, yeah, so, 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 so I didn't really draw the hydrogens. But they don't, 
I mean, when you're introducing these extra bonds, they don't compensate. So, 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 so this this thing here, uh, if if I would think about this as a molecule, uh, this would be a neutral molecule, and this would be a charged molecule because I have one extra electron <coughs> molecule, so it would be a charged object. But you also, I mean, you're going in the place where you've created your kink, you're going to lose a hydrogen because the carbon there now has four bonds around it. Yeah. So, 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 and this is sort of. This is also what I'm saying. This is not really okay. poorly acceptable, but, okay. but uh, of course, if you then would, would, would lose your hydrogen, then that would uh, thing would actually uh, well. But the hydrogen itself is, is, is do you think you would lose the, 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 the proton just or the, 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 my chemistry is very well. So I don't know what actually proton, would happen. But so the proton would, or sorry, the electron would then be in that extra bond you've created. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay, but then, then, then so, so, yeah, so then. One way of thinking about this is really maybe that this hydrogen just flies off the ground. I'm not sure if this is actually what really happened because I don't know this system very well. Uh, but, but yeah, so that, that is something which is really, as I said, really but it's just sort of a complication. It doesn't yeah, really yeah, but it doesn't, it doesn't really, it really doesn't affect this argument. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But these, you know, these half electron states now. Yeah. I mean, but that. We don't even know what the radius is of an electron. No. So what I'm saying is it could just be the extended state of a single electron reaching so, out to a both okay. So, 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 so um, um, what, is, what is important here is that uh, if you would take a uh, hydrogen molecule and you kick out one electron, then the electron would be half of the time on you know, this side of the um, hydrogen molecule and half of the time there. So you would have a, a mixed state and you would it would be an expectation value. This is for the expert. This is not what's going on here. Here there are really eigenstates. So here you can really associate this thing as a physically uh, a charge one half. So this is not what is going on. And so you can, as I said, you can really do experiment and measure it in some cases, and not in this system. Okay, this was maybe a bit technical, but, but yeah. uh, it's a real physical event. That, that's the important message here. Uh, the kings really carry charge in order to uh, and this is something which we call the quantum number fractionalization because charge is like a quantum number and it gets halved. The excitations you create here have smaller quantum numbers than the, the building groups. And this process has actually been observed in all kinds of systems. So it's real. Okay, so how much time do I have? Um, uh, just maybe 10 or 12 minutes. 10 or 12 minutes. minutes. Okay, so... Um, okay, I'll... Um, there's something called the fractional quantum Hall effect. Uh, where in the, in the integer quantum Hall effect, uh, this, this number here multiplying this e squared over 8 was an integer. Uh, in the fractional quantum Hall effect, this number, well, the name tells you it's, it's a fraction. Uh, this is a case. These, this is a case uh, of, a, of, a, of a state that was observed experimentally first, and it was rather quickly explained afterwards. And so this state here uh, has actually particles that um, uh, have these fractional charges. And so I'm going to hop over quickly to one experiment, uh, which is actually sensitive to this charge. And so. Uh, so the, the mechanism is actually slightly different from the polyacetylene mechanism. But, uh, uh, so the prediction was uh, in 83 that these things are fractionally charged uh, particles. So uh, so they, what they actually did is. Uh, <coughs> So, uh, how could you measure these charges? So, um, um, because this is such an important issue, I'm going to take two minutes, and then I'll hop to the other, to the last one. And so, uh, how can you measure charges? So, um, when it was over, it came over here, it was rainy. In winter, it might be here. And so, if you're inside a, a, a house, or 
you hear an attack and it starts to heal. You hear noise, it makes noise. So can you use that noise to, uh, to determine the size of the hail? And the answer is yes. So if I hail back and back and back, and it starts to hail harder, then the noise will get louder. But also the noise will get louder if the hail itself gets big. So the noise is actually proportional to how much it, how much hail there is, but also to the size of it. And so a, uh, uh, yeah, the bigger the noise, the, the larger the size of the hail. And so this is noise created by single events. There are single events happen. And so uh, a very similar experiment can be done to uh, determine the noise in these quantum wall systems. And so basically what people do, let me go directly to this setup, is that these, these particles, uh, they move along the edges of this quantum wall thing. But what one can do is one can bring these edges close together by some means. And so then what can happen is that a quantum tunneling event can take place. So one of these particles, which lives on the edge here, can tunnel through this constriction as we call it. Those and and so now we're sending a current here. Most of the current will just move along this edge and it will disappear there. But the particles that hop over, uh, and if I make this tunneling small enough, it happens one by one in, in, in a very low frequency. But the ones which tunnel over because it's parallel will end up with me. If I send through a current here uh, on, on this side, uh, I will also pick up some of the current in me because of the thing, the magnetic field that everything. And so then, uh, because this is a uh, tunneling event, it's like, uh, like hail, it's, it's like short noise, it's single events, uh, I can actually determine uh, the noise and it's proportional to, to both the current and the size of the hail. And this is an experiment which was then done in 97, uh, in, uh, where, where uh, they, they verify uh, this behavior. So, so here's the line plotted for, for which you would get from, from charge E particles tunneling, which they can actually measure by going to the integer quantum wall effect where we only have electrons. And then this is the measured curve uh, which you get for uh, in this one third quantum wall effect. And this, they, they really get this in the three charge which was predicted in 1983. Uh, uh, and so there's actually very many experiments by now which have to show the extraction of charges. So this is really, this is really these things are there. These things can, of course, not exist outside of these two-dimensional systems. You cannot just take them and send them through a wire and have them mm -hmm. do something. So, so they can only live in these 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 these, these quantum balls that are here. But inside there, they're really there. So they're not electrons which are chopped up in your uh, But they are particles inside this this. Uh, so now I have maybe eight minutes left or seven. Yeah. <laughs> eight minutes. So uh, so now um, one thing which is interesting about these particles is, is uh, that they don't only have fractional charge, but they also have something which is called fractional statistics. And statistics has to do with we're used to that you have two different types of behavior. We have bricks which just bump into each other. And then we have waves, and waves can travel through each other. So there's that bridge. So you, can, well, we, you don't see the beams, but I can make the beams cross. You know, you're not supposed to do that. Uh, so it means if I do this with laser light, I can, the, the beams would just go through each other, and so light are bosons, so that's not a problem, and bricks are like fermions. And so, in these, 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 these types of particles, uh, and so this is actually the only possibility in, in, in three dimensions, bosons are frozen. But in two dimensions, uh, uh, for reasons I'm going to hop over, they can also have fractional statistics, namely be something in between. And so, if I exchange two fermions in the wave function, maybe you've heard that the wave function picks up a minus sign. And if I exchange the wave function, I exchange two bosons from the wave function, it remains the same. Well, these guys would pick up some arbitrary fixed one. Or in this case, uh, well, a specific one, but it doesn't have to be a plus sign or a minus sign. So these particles, 
uh, they have rather peculiar statistics properties. And so now I was actually going to explain that people try to do measurements of this, and you can use interferometry to do that. Uh, it turns out to be extremely hard. And at the moment, there's no conclusive evidence that fractionally statistics particles exist. Uh, although, theoretically, if you have a fractional charge, it has to have fractional statistics as well. So theoretically, it's unavoidable. But the experiments are not conclusive for all kinds of reasons. So let me see. So, <coughs> I thought the statistics had to do with the spin. Ah, okay. So, uh, so yeah, in, in three dimensions there's something called spin statistic theory. If you have integer spins, you have one type of statistics. And if you have half integer spins, you have the other type. And this only works in three dimensions in time. In two dimensions, there is no spin statistic theory. Then you can break it. And I just hopped over explaining this. I can do this afterwards if you want. So, uh, uh, something I also hopped over is that all of these quantum holes that you were observed have all denominators. That actually has to do with that the building blocks are fermions in the electrons. So people worked hard to, to actually prove mathematically that this was the only possibility. And then in 87, uh, something with an even denominator okay, came about, uh, which is now being rather well established. And so uh, in 1990, Moore and Reed proposed uh, uh, an explanation for this common ball effect. And they propose something uh, which is even more exotic statistics than just this fractional statistics. And this is something called non obedient statistics. And non obedient statistics is something which lies at the heart of uh, these potential applications and why there's so much excitement about these things. So even though this was first proposed in, in, in these types of quantum hole systems, uh, there are all kinds of proposals where these types of particle and non obedient statistics might be occurring on, on the surface of these topological insulators. So, even though I sort of put, put up this quantum hole type picture, uh, there are all kinds of other proposals in topological insulators. I don't have time to talk about the details. So, um, so, so, what is at heart of this is that if you take uh, four of these, these uh, uh, these anions which were predicted by more and weak, and, and so far there's no conclusive evidence that they existed. But it turns out that uh, the state actually really forms like a qubit. So we take four of these anions, and we're not, we don't have a single state, but now we have two states. And so, what, so, so let's call them zero and one like we used to do with, with qubit states. And so uh, we can use these, these, these two different states that these anions can be in, and we can use this to store information. But now, something, uh, and I cannot explain to this to you at the moment, because it will take too much time. But it turns out that these two states have a rather peculiar property. Namely, if I just locally look at these states, if I could do that, uh, I cannot tell these two states apart. Locally, they look really the same. It's only that globally that they, they, uh, uh, they, they, they are really different. And so if I would change some of the, I try to, to perturb these states, some perturbations, because locally, perturbations are typically local things. And so we have some local talk, or we locally do something. Because these states locally are the same, they, 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 they are changed in the same way. And that means that I can store quantum information in this state in a very robust way. Uh, so, so local perturbations uh, won't harm these states. So I wouldn't create bit split errors or phase errors because local perturbations act in the same way in these guys. And so you don't change some overall phase of these qubits. So, uh, so now one can wonder if these things are so stable, how are we ever going to do, if we, if we want to do, we want to do computation with them, we actually need to be able to change what these states are. So we need to, to, to actually change them. We need to be able to change them. And so, uh, what one can do is, one, one, to do this, one can add topological and non-trivial stuff in there. 
So if I have these particles, I can sort of break them around each other. And then I'm doing something nominal from the MD. I take one particle and break it around the other. And that turns out that one can actually do uh, topological operations for these types of states. Uh, but I have to do something rather complicated, and I have to break them around each other. And so um, maybe I. Uh, so typically, if I have a wave function, uh, in this case, we have two states. So I write it as a vector. And so if I exchange amiens, normally if I exchange stuff, I pick up phase vectors. But now because I, uh, uh, I, I, I uh, have these two states, I can actually uh, also interchange these states. So this means that in, in technical terms, I have to apply a matrix if I exchange particle one and three. And so, uh, so if I change particle one and three, I get a certain matrix. And if I exchange particle two and three, I get another matrix. And if you do the calculation, uh, one very funny thing one realizes is that if I do the order in which I do these breaks actually changes the outcome. So if I do it in one way, I do M first and then M, I get outcome A. But if I do it the other way around, I get some other outcome. And uh, normally, if we just exchange particles, this would never happen. So, uh, so, and this is why we call this non-linear means ordering. And so now, uh, uh, as a simple example, uh, if you uh, have four of these onions uh, and say <coughs> they start out in state zero, uh, if I just do nothing, they will end up in the state zero. But if I now change, uh, so, so time is going up, so I don't do nothing, zero stays zero. But if I now exchange uh, particle two and three, if I break particle two completely around the other one, I actually end up in the other state. And so in this case, uh, if you take these endings of the more weak state, if you literally do this, uh, you will go from one state to the other. And this is what we call not gate. So by using particles in this particular state, uh, we can impl implement the not gate. And uh, again, this is a topological state, so it doesn't really matter uh, how I break this thing around the other thing, if I do this in a slightly different path, uh, that's not that matter. I always go from zero to one. And so also the break processes in this case uh, are topologically protected. It doesn't matter how I break them around. Uh, the only thing I have to make sure of is that the particles are far apart from each other. But as long as I do that, uh, this thing again is, is uh, topologically protected. Any two of them? Um, one and three. Uh, in this case, if you only have four of these guys, uh, uh, so uh, let's see. I think in some cases, if you would exchange one and two, you might get the face vector or something. That's then really what you call for which particle. So uh, I don't know precisely offhand. Uh, 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 it depends also if. It depends on how you prepare your state. I think that, that's the key thing. That's the right answer. So what you go zero and how you prepare your state. Uh, in case <coughs> so it might be good to go to yeah. Yeah. Any, any questions you can ask. Yeah, so, so, so let me, uh, uh, so one thing I want to say is that, uh, of course, if you do a computation, you have to be able to prepare your state and you have to be able to measure your state. And this can be done using the geometry. Uh, and so uh, maybe I'll just put on my uh, sort of inclusion slides for. Uh, uh, so. Uh, I'll just go through this quickly if that's okay. And then, then basically I'm done. So, uh, so can one use devices like this, states like this, to do something? So uh, uh, so doing topological quantum computation has lots of advantages. Namely, once you have a topological state, all your operations are protected by topology, which makes it very robust. So that's a very good thing. Uh, 
And so this, all these decoherence problems you have in the other cases might be much less significant. Uh, but but uh, so far, we don't really have strong evidence, or well, we have strong indications, but we don't really have good evidence that uh, uh, these non dependent enemies actually exist. We, we, uh, most theorists are really convinced that they are there, but there's no experimental evidence. So this is, of course, essential. So maybe these anions, these particles are not being that's what we put to the paper roll that we will do. So, so but very, uh, so I, I discussed quantum whole setups, but these things have been observed in, in, uh, uh, in different types of setups, uh, have been proposed in different types of setups where there's also very strong indications that they're being there. We don't have time to go through all of this. One of the problems with this, these types of enemies, these are the most abundant ones, is that uh, they're not universal. So this phase gate that you need universality cannot be dealt with these things, at least not in a topologically protective way. So that's the drawback. Uh, now in theory, you can cook up with all kinds of other stuff. So we can uh, cook up states, which my definition would be preserved, uh, which have particles, which non abelian particles of this type, which are rich enough. So uh, to do universal computation. But uh, there, there's really not even the first experiment which hints at that this is true. So there we be. Uh, so, uh, so to summarize, I think I think that this, these states, apart from being extremely interesting in themselves for, for fundamental reasons, uh, if they are uh, found, they provide a really interesting way for uh, quantum computation. Um, uh, but here, the uh, experimentally. It's fair to say that, that ion traps and all kinds of other things, they are way, way further ahead than topological They are sort of systems where they have qubits. The topological states So uh, I'll just put up completely for you. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much.